Um, okay, first of all, I should say that this is not my work, but a work of Christoph Molnar, who is my PhD student in Munich. Um, so before I will um, demonstrate the R package here, which is also called uh, IML, yeah, for interoperable machine learning, let me walk you through at least some of the methods that we have implemented there. Most of the stuff is um, hopefully um, not too hard to understand. So, well, we all know that machine learning models um, have a huge potential uh, for applications. They are, we have now, nowadays very powerful predictors. Yeah, we, for example, had a tutorial here on extreme gradient boosting, one of the, really the most powerful models out there at the moment. But you also all know that um, these models can be extremely complex and quite hard to understand, and this is uh, a huge, um, let's say, barrier for adoption. Yeah? Why is that? Um, if you are using these models in uh, critical applications, I don't know from, let's say, the medical area, maybe you are estimating credit default rates, um, you kind of have to understand these models and you have to explain models and prediction to users. In the European Union, we might now be um, kind of obliged to explain at least predictions yeah, for, for these types of algorithms. Um, and I would say in all other areas that are maybe a bit less critical, interpretation at least helps a lot. Yeah? Um, in machine learning, you have various uh, ways to shoot yourself into the foot. Yeah? Stuff can go wrong on all stages, but you have no chance of well, debugging and improving models if you're only calculating a few numbers, a few performance metrics from cross-validation. Yeah? So interpretation is needed also to understand, well, to, to, let's say to debug and improve models a lot, right? Um, what tools do we nowadays have available? Well, there's the um, old fashioned stuff, let's say, from statistics, linear models, GLMs, um, they all have their uses, but in some cases they're not powerful enough. We all know this. We, there are decision trees. Um, they are also not the most stable uh, and best performing predictors. And then there's model-specific uh, methods. Um, we have lots of stuff available, for example, to explain random forest, random forest models. Um, yeah. But what we actually would like to have here is something that's model agnostic that we can put on top of basically any uh, machine learning models um, that we have created during our model selection process. Yeah, we all know ML is um, quite an empirical experimental discipline at the moment where you have to be able to swap out models yeah, and change stuff because sometimes, well, depending on your task, a different type of model works best. Um, so here are a couple of um, things that are currently, well, discussed a lot in, in the scientific community for IML. So, um, first one is permutation feature importance. So you can kind of categorize all of these methods into global interpretations. So global interpretations are interpretations, well, relating to the co complete model and local interpretations for explaining individual predictions. The first two methods I'll explain here are global. Yeah? So permutation feature importance is what you, most of you probably already know from the random forest um, importance metrics. Um, the idea is to compute an error estimate, a generaliz generalization error on the original data set uh, and the original model. And then for um, a important score for each individual feature, you basically just shuffle that feature a couple of times, yeah, compute the increase in error, or let's say the drop in performance, uh, and you average this across uh, many permutation iterations. Now, this is very, very uh, similar to a, let's say, permutation permutation test. Uh. If you have now scored features and know which are potentially the most important ones, it would be quite nice to understand also the effect of that feature on the outcome, right? So what we would actually like to produce is a plot here where on the x-axis we have um, plotted a probably influential feature and on the y-axis we have plotted the average outcome, yeah? depending on the feature value here. And this is exactly what we are also going to compute here in this uh, partial dependence plot. Yeah? So the idea is to compute this expectation over, you can do this also for a set of features, yeah? um, for XS. Yeah? This is the feature group of interest, and this is the stuff we are not interested in, and this, this we are just going to integrate out. Uh, and what you do is you kind of just do that by Monte Carlo integration, um, and one way to do this in a um, deterministic fashion is you, for each um, value yeah, of your feature of interest, 
that you want to compute um, the PDP value for, you copy the whole data set, you, f you artificially fix the value of that feature to that constant value here, you compute all of the predictions from your model, and then you just average, yeah? And you do this for one, two, and three, and now I can produce a plot here. Of course, you can do this also for, I don't know, some, some hundred values, and then plot that curve and have a look at it. You could also just look for, let's say, the estimated outcomes here for the first observation, and if you plot these lines, yeah, so this one or this one here, um, you get what is called an ice plot. Uh. Third method, um, and this is now a local interpretation model, a uh, local interpretation method to explain individual predictions uh, is called LIME. Uh. And what this does, so the idea is like this. So assume you have a very, very nonlinear um, predictor it's quite likely that all global explanations are a bit misleading yeah, because it's, it's really hard to kind of come up with a simple structure that explains the complete model. Yeah, so maybe this is, this is impossible to achieve uh, with, uh, I don't know, maybe this is kind of impossible to achieve. What is potentially a bit easier to do is if you're just trying to understand here the, how the prediction at that specific place claim, came about, right? Maybe you just want to explain how a, a, um, a specific uh, prediction for your current observation under consideration has happened. And the idea is to just study, well, the predictor in a local neighborhood uh, around this place and put, hopefully we can um, get away with fitting and approximating the predictor with a much simpler, potentially a linear model, uh, maybe a sparse linear model around this space here. And we all know how to explain linear models uh, and draw draw inference on those. And this is exactly what's happening. Yeah? We are um, taking our um, X of interest. We are now sampling data and wait from our original data set and weighting that by the weighting these data points um, with respect to the distance to that point X of interest. We are now running a weighted fit of a simple linear sparse model uh, and outputting the interpretation of that. Uh. And let me check the time, okay, pretty good. Um, and this is implemented now in this IML package of Christoph. This is pretty new. This uh, has been uploaded to Kran, I think, a couple of months ago, and we are still heavily working on this, uh, extending this. Uh, um, it's written in R6, uh, so that is a newer object-oriented dialect for R. Um, the scope of the package is um, it assumes that model selection is already over, you have decided your, you have decided upon um, your machine learning model. You kind of now, either in the um, way of deploying this or kind of um, trying to understand it, maybe maybe improve it a bit. Yeah? But the package doesn't do any types of refits. Yeah? It assumes the model is already there and it's fixed. Models can come from um, different machine learning models and uh, machine learning toolkits in R. So either from the MLR package, that is what I have developed uh, some years ago. Um, you can also input a carrot model or anything else, uh, just a basic a model that you just fit it manually with R and then maybe you have to write a few lines of uh, glue code, but this is also supported uh, um, by the IML package. Uh, you can either have a look at the Kran page of IML or the GitHub page and Christoph actually has written uh, an open book. Um, on IML types of techniques. Maybe you want to have a look at that as well. That explains all of these methods uh, much more in depth than I can do here in, I don't know, 15 minutes. Um, what's implemented, basically everything that I have covered so far, so um, feature permutation, feature importance, um, partial dependence plots, LIME, there's also uh, Shapley values um, and tree surrogates, and some new work on interactions, which is, I think, um, not yet finished uh, completely. Um, if you're interested in the topic and you don't know about Shapley values, I highly encourage, I can't cover those here, but I highly encourage you to have a look at those. That's a concept from gain theory, um, which is uh, quite popular, has become quite popular, and the mathematical principle behind this is, is in my opinion, quite nice. Yeah? Um, so if you don't know that, um, study the papers on that. Um, how does this uh, work in R code? So you load IML. 
um, we are importing um, an example data set here. So I've tried to um, keep this quite simple. So this is more like a toy problem. This is the bike data set I've downloaded from UCI. This is data on um, bike rentals. Uh, that's the output variable here is this count thing where you can see how many bikes were rented um, on a given day um, in the years 2011 and 12. And then we have some input features here on whether that was a holiday, what month we were in, what season we were in, the weekday, um, of course, weather uh, situations, uh, temperature, humidity, and so on. Huh? And all of that should kind of obviously influence how many bikes were rented. Huh? So let's see whether that drops out um, from the interpretation as well. So let's fit a machine learning model. So uh, because I'm the creator of MLR, I've used MLR for this. Uh, so I'm fitting a regression random forest here training in the model. Like I said, you can also do this, I don't know, with carrot or manually. Yeah? So now, the first thing we have to do to um, make IML work, we have to create a so-called uh, IML predictor. This is just a little bit of glue code, so predictions will now become completely standardized. So you create an R6 class here, yeah? so predictor uh, $new, that's the constructor for the R6 class. You pass in the model, and what you also pass in is the data um, that the model has been fitted on. Yeah? So this is a data frame, the X, version, yeah, the input features of the data, and the Y column. Yeah? Just input that, and from now on, we'll just use that predictor for all of the interpretation methods. Yeah. Um, and all of these things you can now call by um, writing down a single line of R code, usually. Yeah? So it, for all of these uh, interpretation methods, there's a separate R6 class. So here for the feature importance, you say feature importance dollar $new. You pass in the predictor, and in this case, we also have to pass in a uh, loss function, a performance metric, which, is, which Christoph in this case took from the metrics package, which uh, implements a dozen of these. And this now specifies how drop in performance is measured. Yeah? And you can plot this now. You can see here, well, this is not very surprising, right? Temperature seems to be the most uh, influential um, feature regarding bike rentals. Yeah? And then there's humidity, the month, and so on. Um, of course, you can also see and uh, study these results in a tabular form. Yeah? can access those. Um, you can create partial dependence plots. That's now a call into a different R6 class, which is called partial. You pass in the predictor. You pass in uh, the feature you are interested in, in this case. Well, let's study temperature. And you can also produce, uh, instead of just an average curve, you can produce these individual ice curves here. And if you average those, you end up with this yellow line. And you can also see that after a certain um, yeah, temperature, actually, this, the effect goes down a bit, right? Because it's now too hot to enjoy riding your bike. Um, the ice plots are not unimportant because this average yeah, for the PDB can sometimes be a bit misleading and you can kind of see the variation also whether there's heterogeneous structure going on if you plot these individual curves as well. Yeah, so it's probably a good idea to do this. Um, you can also reuse this um, uh, plot other features um, and you can also see here that this is implemented for categorical features as well. So this is the influence of the weather situation, whether it's good, misty, or even rainy, um, snowy, or stormy. Yeah? And this produces now um, a box plot, and this ev or server box plots, and this average curve here again for the PDP curve. Um, last one is Lime. So that works um, in a similar one-line fashion. Yeah? So you um, call this local model thing here. Um, Again, call the constructor. Again, you pass in the predictor. And now you have to choose um, your X of interest. Yeah, I took an observation uh, um, with this ID here, which um, produces a very, very low um, count of uh, rented bikes. Um, um, and this K here controls the sparseness. So what is being fitted for a local model is um, an L1 regularized, so a LSU type of uh, linear model. Uh, and this K controls how many variables will be active in the resulting uh, sparse linear model. Uh, in this case, I set this to three, so I can plot this a bit easier. And you can see that um, the low amount of bike rentals for this specific observation is probably due to because um, season is still spring. It's uh, apparently a bit colder. Yeah, and it, this was a um, either rainy, snowy, um, or stormy day. I don't know exactly. Yeah? So there's only one um, category for these uh, three uh, types of weather situations. And temperature had a mildly positive influence here. Huh? That's it for me. Huh? It was actually quite fast. That's uh, very surprising. Let me um, end uh, with a few comments. So
So first of all, like I said, this package is pretty new. We are heavily working on this. It will likely be um, quite a lot uh, extended in the next, uh, in the upcoming months. Second, let me issue um, a small word of warning. Most of these methods here, um, or some of them, are very new, um, or, or they are new in um, their application now to arbitrary machine learning models. We are missing lots of um, scientific validation for them, um, and um, I think they, most of them should also be enhanced a lot with uh, uncertainty quantification, because these interpretations can be misleading, they can be wrong, and we need more scientific methods built on top of this. I think this is also a very, very um, good field for um, statistics, statisticians and machine learners actually joining forces uh, to work on a pretty exciting and I would also say very relevant topic. I um, guess I'm going to end here. If you have any questions, please, uh, please ask me either now or later. At the moment, not, but we are working on this. So um, this is actually a very um, relevant problem, I would say. Um, Caroline Strobel has published extensively on this. Um, so what, what is implemented here is basically what Breimann suggested for the random forest there many years ago, yeah, out of back um, feature permutation importance. Yeah? Um, and uh, Caroline has uh, extensively published on the fact that this can be biased um, if there are high correlations among the features. She um, implemented a new variant for this for the random forest, which is implemented in the sea forest package. Yeah? Um, I actually read her paper again some, some days ago, and I think what she did there can be generalized to arbitrary models. Um, we are looking into this currently. At the moment, this is not implemented, and this can be a problem um, for these types of methods. Now, this is exactly one of these points I was kind of um, um, yeah, um, referring to in my, my word of warning. Yeah? So, if there are high correlations, that, that can be problematic. Read her paper on this. Um, it, uh, it depends a bit what you actually are kind of, how you actually de define also what permutation importance means. Yeah? But I, I'm guessing we might take her um, approach and generalize that. Anything else? Please. Yes, it was, but it's pretty clean, normal R6 style that we're using here, right? So, I mean, actually, Christoph thought about whether he should put some, I don't know, syntactic sugar on top of this, yeah, so kind of to hide this, because this is a bit maybe um, less common for normal R users, but I have to say I, I like R6 a lot, and I think this should be kind of visible that we're using that, right? Yeah, but it was a, was a decision. <laughs> Thank you.